Hello there. Welcome to this evening's Artist Talk, part of the Grow at Home series, part of Grow's cultural programme supported by the Cultural Recovery Fund. This series can be found on Grow's website and is designed to keep us all connected and sharing. Just a few housekeeping rules to begin with. This session is being live streamed and recorded, so if you'd rather be, not be on camera, feel free to turn it off. Uh, please keep yourself on mute and ask questions in the Zoom chat and I'll ask them to Pete later on in the Q&A. Okay, so I'm Jordana, I'm your host today and I'm very much looking forward to this session and I know I'm not alone. There's been a lot of interest in this talk as Pete is a prolific and fascinating artist and he's been delving into his archives to take us on a journey from Blackpool to Hackneywick and everything in between. To introduce Pete, I cite the words of Billy Childish. Pete Bennett's paintings and drawings are simple gifts that can be turned into beautiful, ugly and indifferent, as if composed by a drunken man on a moonlit stroll, who, intoxicated by as much be the night air by the wine beer, sings uninhibited ditties to the stars in the pan. So, rooted in a simple engagement with nature, dashed out in the recognisable code of ever-arising vibrating shaki, Pete's paintings are musical mark makings, a celebration of the very nature of poetic being. In this way, engaging with the musical echo of bird, tree or man, Pete makes his paintings and drawings, whether full of harmony or violent discord, they are always beautiful, assured and better than we deserve. So on that note, Pete, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, amazing words by Billy there. Um, Hello everyone. I'm just gonna um, I'm gonna run through like almost like a slideshow of stuff, which is the work that I did in the first lockdown. You know, last I mean, pretty much a year ago, which was a, it's a selection of it. I did a lot of drawings of the homeless people in Manchester. I made some collages of um, the new build kind of buildings and composed music to go with them in a part of all cap, um, a, a sheet music app. And I did these ongoing series of doomsday manuals, which are sort of light-hearted, dark-humoured, uh, current affairs, contemporary mm -hmm. life kind of uh, satire kind of thing. So I'm just going to roll through these. Um,
Right. So that's what I did in lockdown. The, the audio quality is just um, very basic. If you want to listen to them, I'll put the links on the sound. We've got SoundCloud links and everything. So I guess, how did we get there? How did we get to this place? Well, um, I guess most people know that's Blackpool. So and this is where I'm from and uh, it's where I was born. And it's kind of like that, isn't it? It's um, all bright lights and neon and the illuminations and the trams and illuminated trams and all this kind of stuff. And really amazing, unusual architecture, like this kind of sort of Miami-esque modernism of like, trying to it's all a lot, a lot of it's built in the 1920s 30s and 50s and you know and these big skies and and kind of 1920s roller coasters uh this is like the coney island kind of place the pleasure beach you know and they they, they actually they've got they had four or five original roller coasters there that were built by people from um coney island proper american roller coaster builders and they're all kind of working and terrifying because you can see how rusty and kind of decrepit they look in the winter. And there's also, you know, like apart from this, when you got off the main drive, you know, there's another side to the town. And when I grew up in the eighties, it was pretty much like this. This is actually quite recently. I mean, some other parts of the town um, behind the, the kind of facade of all this uh, golden mile and all that kind of stuff, it incredibly run down and, you know, betting shops and, cash converters and payday loan and all this kind of, you know, really, really tragically run down and people, you know, like lots of kind of the people who kind of capitalize on, on that, you know, and try and offer alternatives like, you know, the, uh, Jesus or religion or, you know, far right politics or the, the whole kind of lot, you know, that people try and, you know, I mean, it really is, this is, this is for real, you know, and, and a lot of towns are like this, you know, where in, in, in the north and the seaside towns that have seasonal work and um, we kind of grew up in this sort of, um, this kind of area. And um, it's also like this though, and this is the kind of bit that I grew up in, which is called Anchor Zone and grew up about a quarter of a mile from the sea. This is kind of almost at the end of our road and it's a wreck of a, Victorian ship called the uh, it's a Norwegian ship called the Abana and it, it ran aground it's a huge a huge ship and everyone was rescued and they took the anchor from it to the church where I was christened and it's the kind of you know like that was I was brought up quite religious and you know you've got things if you can see my cursor out there somewhere on this it was like a, a, a drowned village from kind of three four hundred years ago there and it's just quite interesting and we used to swim in the sea and it was quite amazing and they used to pump raw sewage and our mums used to call us in because you could see stuff horrible stuff flowing past and and so but the, the kind of eu sort of change all that they gave it clean beach status and all that kind of thing so you know that's another kind of thing to kind of worry about but yeah big skies and these kind of amazing places these um right and I think that's what my mum and dad wanted me to be, um, and um, it was uh, it was pretty uh, pretty interesting experience parading past all your mates on a on a gala float, looking like that. And um, what I really wanted to be was something a bit more like that, you know, like um, a little boy with tanks and macho stuff and guns and that. And um, when I was about eleven, we got into punk and that music was our kind of savior you know if you want to if you didn't want to kind of join the mainstream if you you know it was your political education it kind of opened your eyes up to things and um well i haven't got any photographs of me as a kind of punk or my mates you, just, you know like photographs started about now in 2010 didn't they you know selfies and things and we just didn't think to take photographs our mums wouldn't take pictures of us. they thought we looked horrible but we looked really cute and cool we made homemade glasses out of rip the lens out and put like kind of cornflake packets in like pop art kind of and this was a local fanzine run by a guy called John Robb who's um, now a kind of music journalist and musician and TV kind of um, pundit and they were amazing because they had a band around the corner and they were a lot older than us but they they, they organised gigs in local kind of uh, parks and stuff and it was like a scene and you, you you know you wanted to get into this magazine and to get into the magazine you know you'd say oh we've got a band and you'd say yeah but you haven't got any 
show us, you know, give us a, give us a tape or, you know, where, where you're rehearsing. And we, so we, we had to actually get ourselves together. And around, and around the same time, I, was, I kind of left school and my mum and dad sent me to a kind of old guy to, to learn sign writing because I left school and there was no jobs. It was the 80s, really bad kind of in, unemployment and nowhere to work, ICI Chemicals or the Rock Factory or British Aerospace. And I kind of failed, failed, failed the entrance exams to the chemical kind of place, luckily. And, and I kind of did this and, and I guess they were trying to help me because I had anxiety, I was having panic attacks, I was suffering depression, you know, I was getting into trouble and things like that, you know, and you doing all the kind of things that you don't really, um, you don't really want your kids to do. And um, so we got a band together and um, I guess like just briefly, like the town that time, I, I, I kind of described our, our, our bringing in a, a, a editorial I wrote for a men's magazine, which never got published probably because of things like this, but Blackpool, the seasonal bruise under Lancashire's left eye a tough and conservative town, small business rules, selfish, suspicious, mostly white, winning, losing. Those in the know got music out or really high. It was dog town on downers, booze from B&M bargains, skateboards and studs, glue bags behind an arcade or a feel up in a ruined pub with hardcore and Marley mixtape for soundtrack and escape. The rest, delinquent, illegal, boring. You want to go to art college? You in what? So it was kind of, we, you know, I think a lot of people felt quite trapped there and we, we formed a band and we were in the labor, the local labor club. And I think my dad probably drove us here. They were so good to us. We had a hardcore punk band playing in my front room one, one week and then they took us to their gig in this pub and sneaked us in. And they were just, you know, they, they wanted us to do stuff and I'd managed to get some equipment together. My granddad left us some money and a few, a few hundred quid and I bought amps and guitars and that. And, I had a terrible haircut, like a mullet, you know. And that's my kind of oldest mate, Boothie on the drums, who ended up playing for the UK subs. And we originally got our drum kit. He, he found it in the, found it in the local church, and um, kind of it ended up in the rehearsal room. But we ended up getting a better one. And we used to kind of make our own entertainment. We there was abandoned pubs there, and we used to kind of what what you call squatting now. But we just used to kind of occupy them fix them up and kind of uh, there were our kind of youth clubs there weren't any youth clubs there weren't any anything for us to do the town was geared up for entertainment and holidays and uh, young people were banned and so and we kind of got politics as well by then I, bands like Crass and the Dead Kennedys had helped us out with all that and apartheid was a big thing then and you know it felt like you were doing something you know like you're quite young you're like 16 18 something like that and doing our kind of bit you know trying to save the world and um, yeah, so we started gigging and stuff like that. And I had other ideas, you know, I'd been watching late night TV, um, probably looking for kind of rude films or something, but I kept coming across art films and I got into Jackson Pollock and, and I was listening to the Ramones like on loop and it, the kind of combination of this all over kind of sound and this all over kind of thing made me want to do art. And I, I, my mate dragged me kicking and screaming and said, you've got to do an A-level you know, you're going mad here, you know, you, you're wasting yourself. A couple of mates like that just actually made me, forced me literally physically to sign on to an A-level. And I did my bit, you know, they, they said, oh, you can't be a cubist, you've got to do your kind of, you know, A-level stuff. So I did my A-level stuff, which was just pretty standard. And I managed to get into Blackpool Foundation College, which was really good, really surprised. And it started to, started to get involved in that. And um I, I did a, a drawing, uh, I did a painting. They, they taught us to paint like really traditional and to hard graft. It was kind of Slade School of Painting and hard graft. And I really appreciate that. Loads of life drawing. It's the hardest year of art I've ever done in my life. And most people will say that. And at the end of it, I did a, a drawing of a, a big painting of a lion. I kind of tried to use all the skills. I was trying to make a, a statement about power, I think, or something. And uh, it was a, a lion in the park in Blackpool. And I Googled it the other day, and it's actually a Medici lion. It's a copy of a 16th century lion from the Medici um, thing. So I was kind of on the right track about power. But what happened was kind of, and I don't have any photographs of it, but um, what happened basically was um, the tutor kind of hated it. And he said, you can't, you can't, it's not painting from life. You've changed the background and, you, you, you know, and you can't do that kind of thing. And I, I kind of like, you know, I was all ears at that time. I was like, no, I think I can and I'll do that. And then 
he said to me, this is, this is the, tutor, um, the head of the course called Neville with his tank. He used to wear a tank top all the time. And, and he actually said, like, you, you know, you've got in Canterbury a College of Art. That's really good. But, but here you're in a band. And I said, yeah, I'm going to do art and music. And he, he picked the phone up and he said, you can't do art and music. You've got to choose now. And I said, no, I don't think I have. You know, and it was just a moment of like, I, I just felt like actually, you know, like you can't do that to me now. I've got so far, you know, like and you haven't got, I actually said you haven't got the right to do that, put the phone down. And I, he was probably trying to test me really. So I, I kind of appreciate it. And, and I, I kind of walked out and I just left my painting there. And it was probably on a really wonky stretch canvas anyway, because I've never been good at geometry and woodwork. And um, I kind of um, bought a ticket, let, just said, hang it where you like, and bought a ticket for Glastonbury, which is in the corner here, if you can see it. I don't know whether you can, because of all these. Yeah. And uh, borrowed some money off my dad, and we went to Glastonbury for five years, uh, five, five, seems like five years, five days. And um, it was quite incredible. And um, that was me leaving Blackpool. And luckily, I got into Canterbury College of Art, which was, um, I could actually be myself or copy Brian Jones or something like that. I did music, I did art. Um, it was brilliant. There was no fights in the bar every night, like we were in Blackpool or kind of fear of like, you know, talking to the wrong person or it was just a completely different world. And I was just so relieved to kind of go somewhere and, you know, actually not have to kind of fight my corner all the time about nonsense and my anxiety attacks had kind of stopped quite a lot through uh, music kind of helped me with that and certainly when I started at, at Canterbury it was kind of I was focused and I worked really hard I got um ended up doing some cubism I did a mural it was about 18 foot this and it was for the cancer ward corridor to the cancer ward in the local hospital very colorful no photographs in colour, of course. This is from the local paper. And um, my, my, I was doing drawings. Uh, I used to be a printer. I did two printing jobs when I was in Blackpool. Um, one, I kind of, it kind of fell apart because the company fell apart. And the next one really turned up for work one day and they just said the boss has hung himself. You know, it's like the 80s, like Thatcher's Britain, too much in debt. He was like 25, I reckon. He looked like a film star. He had a Porsche. It was just really sad, you know, and, and that's how jobs ended sometimes Like in that time. It was really bleak. And I, I, I started using the end rolls of newsprint because they, they, they're cheap, you know, they're, they're free. They, they got the Guardian, they'll give you them. And drawing in oil paint and I set up big still lifes. And this is about six foot by six foot or thereabouts. And I was doing these big drawings in newsprint and they actually last the distance. I've still got them somewhere and they, they're not rotted away. They said, oh, they'll rot, they'll rot away. And I was like, they probably won't. And um, my Canterbury course kind of culminated in this. And this was a painting um, um, kind of based, you know, like, yeah, I mean, I was trying to do something. It looks like cubism, you know, it's very kind of student work. But I was right. I was doing something about Hillsborough, um, the way the faces were kind of portrayed in the media. I was really angry about that. You know, it's very, it was, very, very beginning of colour photography in the media that kind of made their faces look even more kind of sort of took contorted and off sync colour and things. And, you know, I just felt really felt quite a lot about that. And it, it got in the Whitworth Prize with a, another friend of mine called um, Richard Clegg and, and a, a young artist who was unknown called Chris Feely who did an amazing painting of, called The Queen and I, which was of his mum, you know, and we all met on this kind of... Uh, at the Whitworth uh, Young Contemporaries and it got in the Guardian this and stuff, you know, and it was like brilliant. And and it kind of got me into Chelsea College of Art and um, I did an MA and there's the proof because my mum and dad put it in the local paper, you know, there you go. And uh, so I was on my MA and, um, and it was a year course and I did 18 foot paintings because I told them I'd done that. They just said, what's your biggest work? And I said, 18 foot. And they gave me this massive studio. And I did loads of these 18 foot paintings of which I have no pictures of because they're either in a drawer in London somewhere or just kind of buried under piles of stuff and can't get to them. But this is kind of, this is kind of my idea of what they, what, what, what I would have done if I, you know, when I left college, I expected it to be like this, you know. Chelsea was brilliant. You know, I was with people like Peter Doik, who's like, went on, you know, he's 10 years older than us and he went on to kind of do amazing stuff. And um, people like Sadie Murdoch, you know, kind of just taught me. People who kind of opened my mind up to like politics and stuff like that absolutely kind of blew my mind. And if anything, the course was about that for me. And these 18 foot paintings, 
people didn't kind of stand and look at them like that. I didn't win any prizes. The only people that contacted me were art for officers. And I just thought, I don't want my art in a, in a corporate office. And it made me think, why am I doing 18 foot paintings? It's like museum art. And I left Chelsea and I ended up in Cable Street Studios in, in the East End, doing smaller paintings, living in my studio, working nights in a parcel packing kind of place. Really kind of quite, you know, the, the, the icicle, the drips in the ceiling froze into massive icicles, horrendously cold and sleeping under rolls of canvas. Um, there was a, a, a painter next to me called Frank Bowling, who was like really, you know, like best mates or anything. He was really kind to me, very nice. And he left the painting when he when he left and it was had a bucket stuck to it because he's a painter who does a lot of pouring kind of paint. They've only just started recognising work properly. He's a, a Caribbean artist from Guyana. And uh, he's an octogenarian now, I think. He's, he's, um, and he left the paint and I should have kept it because it's probably worth a fortune. And that's what the studios kind of look like, um, pre-mobile pre phone photographs. It was an amazing time. Um, John Robb kind of popped up again. We, we, uh, the guy who did the fanzines and he said, you know, he said, oh yeah, okay, I've met him. And he said, and he wrote me a thing for ID magazine. And, and I was doing these paintings that were like eight foot tall. This was in Cable Street. Sorry about the picture. They were, you know, based on estate plans of, um, you know, housing estates, things like that. I was walking a lot at night and stuff. I was, I was quite lonely and quite uh, just poor and quite hungry, you know, and kind of just kind of start to get to know the East End. I really loved it. You know, it's a really crazy time. It was these Romanian girls, the wall had just come down. They were super rich and they were driving on the pavement in their... Um, open top murk, drinking champagne, jumping and all this kind of thing. A drag queen lived next door to me. It was like my age had come over from Holland and we, we were sort of inseparable and just did everything together. It's just like, it's just like really cool. It's just like what London was about for me. And it was like, I'm living, living in a studio and, you know, I don't think I actually said anything of this, but John, John's a good writer and he, sophisticated vandalism. Brilliant. That'll do. I was working at the cabin, which is a tiny shop in Shoreditch, you know, for this kind of crazy kind of old hippie kind of um gang who were, and we're doing we started a band and we started to do gigs in this kind of place called the magic bus, bus depot hanging around with used car dealers and kind of pe dodgy people who forged forged antiques you know and they're asking me if you could paint you know, can you can you paint peter you know you could do some forgeries for us you know and all this kind of thing it's like hilarious it's like you know, the, the, this is like this East End, you know, taught me to taught me loads of swear words in Yiddish and stuff like that. It's absolutely amazing. And that's kind of what's left of it now. It's I think Bishopsgate station's kind of demolished. And we moved to Leightonstone. So Leightonstone was like these kind of squats. The road, the M11 link road was going through it. Some ours, artist housing charity had got places there. Um, I was doing paintings like this, kind of shadow paintings and stuff. I brought my mate down from Blackpool you know, to try and cure them their sort of addictions and heroin addictions and stuff like that. You know, I was trying to help the mates out and he was helping me because I was trying to be the singer of the band. We had a singer, uh, my mate Richard, and he kind of left to go to America to do a residency and I had to start singing impromptu one night when he, when, when he turned up late and that was it. I was a singer and I formed this band with uh, Jan Noble and Darren um, Sills. And I swapped that painting for a, a ticket to go to Cologne with my girlfriend at the time to the Nagel Gallery after party and Martin Kippenberger was there and all that. And Martin Kippenberger was like really rude to so called me an English wanker because I, I took um, his Elvis record off and put mud honey on and that, but I didn't care. And um, I bought a guitar, Les Paul, you know, and I borrowed some money off my girlfriend, got an amplifier. I was doing his paintings on newsprint again living in this house, which would torn the ceiling out. So there's just these massive studios, raves every night, um, spiral tribe parties in the, in the woods, just like an incredible area that they called Leighton Stonia. And it was like a road protest. The world was a bit like that, you know, it's just cash only and, you know, no, no kind of, you know, it's just no phones or anything like that. And I was kind of looking like that, <laughs> it's amazing buying milk from the local shop, living in these kind of squat kind of thing, trying to fit in with this. And then um, Paul Monks from Core Arts actually, you know, I met him, I met him for a friend and then um, I met him, he had a studio in Cable Street and we used to sit on the roof and he used to sort of dream about doing something, you know, for the people or for all these people who are abandoned. And that's, you know, it was like, 
amazing. You know, we sit on the roof drinking special brew and he, he managed to get a studio in Stoke Newington. This was my bit and it was an old abandoned sweatshop, an old factory. And I was doing these big paintings and there's like a creeper hanging from the ceiling and it, um, this is huge paintings. The one, this one was really, you know, like there's stuff on the floor like asbestos. So you used to just mix it in with a paint and throw it on there. And this was a really quite a big painting. Um, I don't know, like I think I think I was, you know, I'd started to work back into my black and white kind of paintings and my, uh, you know, I think I was, I was thinking I was making trying to make a point about the far right rising in in in, in Austria at, at that time, hence the colours. Um, you, looking at a lot of comic books and stuff and things that are just going back into what I really enjoyed as a kid. And we turned it into a gallery called The Firehouse. And we, I, I had a connection at Time Out because they, they sort of, when I was on my MA, they'd said something like ridiculously kind of unfeasible, like I was inventing a new language of painting. And I, I, I thought, okay, well, if you think that. And I told them, we'd, I told them we'd, um, we were a new artist collected that formed a, a new gallery in Stoke Newington. They came and reviewed it. And these paintings were about six foot, five foot, something like that. And they called them abstract atrocities. And, it, you know, it wasn't far wrong. You know, I was working from piles of junk that I was finding in the streets and bits of comic imagery and kind of just kind of throwing stuff together. And I think that was one of the most successful ones. I, you know, I've still got these somewhere. But, um, yeah, and I just... Use this is all oil paint. I'd, I'd been using house paint a bit as well, but I, I kind of don't. It's kind of you know colours aren't quite as good, are they? You know if you can afford a bit of oil paint. And we made a rec we, we we went we started doing the music. John Rob was producing albums and um, producing singles. People like Corner Shop and stuff. And he said I'll produce this. So we went and recorded in the um, Sweet Sixteen studio, which was the old Joy Division studio in Rochdale, like proper on tape and everything and um, made records and this was the first album. We did a few singles on vinyl and then because it's so expensive kind of mastering each track, we, we, we did a CD and it got five fists in Metal Hammer. And we were just astonished, you know, we were like, we recorded it in 13 hours straight, you know, we went in to record one song, song and just carried on, it was just nuts. And we went on tour. We organized all our own gigs, went on tour in Britain, in Europe, in Belgium. Scandinavia through this underground network. We, we thought we were going to be pop stars. You know, I was wanting to be a rock star and none of it happened. We weren't even indie stars or anything like that. We just kind of found this DIY network and it was so much more fun. And we had a singing drummer, Jan, who used to write half the lyrics and Darren and just kind of quite, quite amazing, toured all over. And we went on tour with Gold Braid. That was the day after the um, Labour Party first came into power, like Tony Blair, just before I get completely covered in water. It's just amazing, like going on tour with these brilliant bands and touring around Europe and stuff. And did our difficult second album, refused to give it to the Times because we hated Rupert Murdoch, you know, for many reasons, but definitely for what I did with the printers. And my granddad was a printer, my mates were printers, you know, I'd been a printer. And we just had a suspicion about Murdoch. I thought he was a creep. I bought a motorbike, well, I bought a remains of a motorbike and rebuilt it. My dad had died on, on the first tour and I kind of wanted a way of kind of remembering him because I don't really believe in religion and stuff and didn't have a kind of grave to visit. So I kind of restored this motorbike. I started traveling around on it in my spare time and um, found this mural in a church in um, um, Coulsdon in south, just south of London and it's just really rare there's very few of them just discovered another one in Wales I think um mural that wasn't destroyed by the Puritans of the kind of going to hell and people being burned alive and sworn in half and I started doing kind of drawings really crude kind of drawings of it and kept, these, these drawings have sort of stuck with us all my life they're really kind of it was kind of an odd kind of thing you know when I was at Canterbury on my second year, I got knocked off the ladder and had like a near death experience. And I was terrified of heights. So I kind of, this idea of ladders sort of kind of was creeping in my work. It's just something that keeps, I think work just keeps creeping back into you. So to get over my fear of heights, I became a tree surgeon. I've been working on building sites. I wanted to earn money. I wanted to make records. I wanted to do my own art. I wanted to be independent. I wanted a trade and 
I learned to be a tree surgeon, like a really good conservationist tree surgeon. And it's not all romantic like that. That's um, a little bit of topiary I did for the royal family. You just turn up for work and it's, oh, you're working for the Queen's sister today. Oh, well, that's nice. They're really nice people, to be honest. <laughs> it's like just getting drunk watching Wogan on the box all day long, aren't they? Like people at the bottom board. But yeah, he told me to make a perfect sphere. And I said, it's impossible. And that is really annoying at the top of it. But anyway, can't win them all. At the same time, I started drawing um, with kids' pencils. Um, the girl who was on the back of the motorbike and my kind of, kind of step door. And um, they, yeah, I was using their pencils. And um, I just did loads of these drawings. You know, I kind of made my work small again. You know, it's really difficult to kind of, you know, I've been, I've been making records for ages and maybe had a year off. I took a year off for clubbing one year, which was just like, I had a girlfriend who was a club dancer and we just did a club in this kind of crazy lesbian club in Gerrard Street and it was just absolutely brilliant, you know. You know, you just got to do stuff. Oh, Soho was amazing in those days. Just proper, like Francis Bacon was still there. Uh, Peter L. Tool was kind of falling asleep at the bar and stuff in the coach and horses. It was completely mad, Jeffrey Bernard and all that. And yeah, I got more sophisticated with the um, kids' pencils. You can kind of use them. I, I really love them because it's, it's like what is colour anyway. And I've always thought that it's like, it's kind of, your eye makes it up, and then they're kind of almost monochrome. These, although everyone says what lovely colours, they're all the same colours. It's like you're limited to four and a bit of a mix. Okay, at the same time, I was doing these paintings, which is like I wanted to get to the newsprint kind of idea. So I was working wet into wet, so it'd be like wet oil paint, white, and working into it like drawing and stuff like that. Based on I don't know, I think these were kind of based on them things at the bottom of the, the ocean called black smokers, where they're those volcanic kind of outlets or something like that. There's, there's a kind of thing about scale as well. I'll sort of demonstrate it. If you can see, I don't know whether you can see me, I hope you can. But I was worried about, I, I kind of think quite a lot about my work and I didn't want to make museum sized work and I didn't want to make work that was just kind of twee and small and I needed a scale and I kind of found the human scale, which is like this. Right at the end of the brush, and you're kind of painting like that, you know, it's kind of, that's your limitation, really, isn't it? You know, you can lean a bit. And it was kind of about a physicality, of, of a physicality of the scale of work and, and the way it engaged the body, which is something that, okay, that's that's a rule. I can do that. I'm allowed to make that kind of painting. We went on tour. We released an, a single called, uh, Mon um, it was a Monkey Island record called Mussolini's Teaspoons. We had a few harmonica players. That's uh, Dale, one of the, one of the, our harmonica players um, went all over Sweden and we ended up doing our last kind of album as that band. And um, that's what we were doing. We got dropped by our distributors because they thought um, guitar music was going out of fashion. It was about a year before the White Stripes came out, by the way. And so we had to distribute it ourselves. And it got in the, it got single of the week in the Guardian and I rang the distributors up and just said, can you do something about this? It's too late, you know, it's, can't get it in the shops. I was like, thanks for that. And that's us in Italy, being young, um, just having it. We toured the whole of Italy, playing anti-fascist centres, social centres, these amazing places, met loads of cool people, brought Italian bands over here, took other English bands to Italy. We had an amazing band called Lush Rambo, um, Federico Pescarelli and um, Paolo Vichy, the two promoters there based in Ancona and Pescara, just amazing people. And the whole of Lush Rambo, this young band who kind of met us and we just had a brilliant friendship. We're still friends, like we got to each other's weddings and things. And we had really cool fans who were very um, devoted, you know, tattooed their kind of sim our symbol on their chest. I was doing paintings like this in a room in Stoke Newington. So the room wasn't much bigger than the frame of the actual screen. And it was claustrophobic, but I just had to keep painting and working. The whole room was like a big still life. It was, I had a TV on a black and white TV hanging from a, a, a hole cut in the ceiling with like on, with ropes and just piles of stuff. And the TV was always on on static or kind of scrolling, you know, vertical hole gone and just kind of chaotic. And I was writing songs in there. And Jan was living upstairs. At one point, we shared a bed. Like I'd sleep on the floor one night. He'd sleep on the bed, sharing the bed, sharing the floor for about months. At one point, you know, and we were just going on tour, organising our own tours. We we're quite. Um, 
quite a, a passionate band. You know, if you want a spinal tapism, we were like a straight edge band that got drunk. And um, we were very political, very passionate, very kind of, you know, like that. And that's not, he wasn't even a band, that's our tour manager, Seamus. And he had a degree in um, Middle Eastern politics. So I imagine we were discussing something quite important. And um, yeah, that passion often kind of ends, you know, you can't keep it, sustain it forever. And uh, that band ended probably quite a bit like that. And um, I went off into the woods. I got a terribly bad back, slipped a disc and I couldn't walk for three months. I was on sticks and stuff. And I, I started drawing small again, like landscapes and things in the seas. I was going to Wales, you know, with my partner and, you know, in the seaside at Wales, a beautiful kind of rocks and stuff, Grain Sutherland country kind of thing. And, I lived in the woods in Devon and taught myself sly guitar. I formed a band, my, my, my partner, I formed a sly guitar band, the double O with this guy. Um, we played on homemade amplifiers and old kind of Grundig tape recorders, just wired them up to make them work. And I, I formed it with my partner who just said, I want to be in a rock and roll band like Rockabilly. You know, can you play that? And I was like, yeah, I'll write some that kind of blues songs. Yeah. And we were called the double O and it was amazing. And she was very inspiring, kind of almost like a muse, you know, and, um, she'd come up with one line and I'd just go, wait, wait, stop. And then write a song based on it or something. It was great. Um, and I joined Morning Bride, my favourite band from Stoke Newington, where I've been living. And they were like an um, Americana band, like a Gothic Americana band. We just did loads of records with them and toured with them. And got two new members of Monkey Island. This was all at the same wedding, actually, out in Devon that we all went to. And these two young guys just said, I want to play with you. And I said, brilliant. And we made another album. Um, and it was kind of the, the drummer got cancer and um, he, he, he had to go for chemotherapy and he thought he was going to die. So we recorded the album in a day uh, and drop out studios in, uh, in, in, in South London. You know, we, we were part of this North London blues scene, kind of punk blues, kind of people like the Penthouse and all this kind of these crazy bands and stuff. It was brilliant, you know, drinking in FS bar before we just Turkish people before they were even trendy and, we did, uh, we did an album and the gigs still ended up like that. You know, it's probably why I ended up with a bad back and that used to somersault over the monitors and stuff and hilarious, great. You know, just like really half an hour to change the world, you know, a revolutionary performance, if you can, you know, that was the philosophy. And um, I was writing for N16 magazine, uh, which is a really left-wing publication. You know, I was into crass when I was a kid and Penny Rambo was writing for this magazine. It was just brilliant and it was... For, for a local magazine, it was just covered really, really in-depth kind of stuff. And we'd been busy at home. And um, I, I, Zoe, then our Zoe, our daughter, then was born. And she was the biggest double O fan, of course. And I started drawing, you know, drawing smaller things, um, ink stuff, revisiting sketchbooks that I've done at Chelsea, where cheaters said, oh, I like your ink drawings or something like that. And you'd be like, no, I want to make these big spunky paintings and they go like okay maybe you'll get back to that uh work you know i just had a dream one night i, I woke up in the middle of the night the kid was asleep and um couldn't sleep had this weird dream about, <laughs> about muhammad coming to me and saying that um the origins of aramaic you know something was the, the kind of swirls of the of the gins in the desert and i was just like i just started painting i was just like Right, I'm going to start painting it again. You know, like I've had, I've had six months off. I'm going to start again. New, new ideas, new ideas. You know, I just love dreams. It's like your brain talking to you, isn't it? Just processing stuff. Um, when I was a kid in Blackpool, there's this guy called Andrew Stamper who lived around the corner, and he used to buy old radios, and he taught me how to take electronic valve radios apart. And re weirdly, at the same time um, as this happened, I, I started building amplifiers. Many, many years later, I mean, and. And so it was kind of like a really lovely kind of uh, synchronous kind of thing. And an old guy taught me to build amplifiers and fix them. And I started building my own amps. And this guy called Billy Childish, who I kind of knew, said, um, can you fix my amp for me? And I said, yeah. And I said, I'm doing an art exhibition. I'm organizing this Stoke Newington Fest, Fringe Festival. It's massive. And I want to put local artists with famous ones. Will you put a painting in? And he went, what do you know about art? And I was like, well, I, I do art, you know, and he was like, I said, you know, I'm not trying to, and he was like, come on, show us your work. And he said, I really like your work. So he was in the exhibition. I fixed his amp and his old amp from milkshakes. And um, 
and he, he gave me this exhibition with this gallery called L13, who was actually a guy I'd been on tour with. We, we did a tour with his, his band years ago when he was the musician. He'd set up a gallery and um, he did un, unseen paintings. And I, I was like in my 40s by now. So that's time, you know, compression. That's kind of Proustian time compression for you. But um, yeah, they did this exhibition, Unseen Paintings. And these were about, you know, based on those kind of drawings that I'd done in the in the um the old kind of mural, church mural, and uh, people falling off ladders and kind of climbing ladders, ascending them, and I kind of think that's you know it's kind of I don't know like that's what, the way the world is, isn't it? You're trying to get get somewhere, you can't get up there, and you know people are scapegoated, and you know you, you can't you, you know the, the way like John Berger talks about kind of you know like the, uh, our aspirations are kind of narrowed by presenting un, un, unattainable desires to us. You know we can never can never get to this thing that advertising and capitalism, you know, blah, blah, blah. And these, I guess it was about three foot by four foot. And these were smaller. This is pre phone photography. Phone photography is so much better. This was like a really expensive camera. <laughs> these paintings like this. I'm going to whisk through a few of these. They either oil and, on the and black and white oil on wet canvas, wet, or white canvas or acrylic. I don't mind using acrylic when it's black and white sometimes for small stuff, so it looks plasticky. Um, drawing around, just really simple ideas, like drawing around heads and the, the, the smoke coming out, you know, like making them into mountains. When we were in Italy, a guy said, those mountains there, they are where Aphrodite made love to Zeus. And the South Mediterranean has got so many myths like that. And I just sort of did that. And it's like the Feast of the Pentecost or something. I was, I was brought up on the Bible, so I kind of know about all that stuff. And, you know, these men are lying on the floor with flames coming out of their mouths. It's like, it's like rock and roll, isn't it? You know? And uh, I wrote, Blackpool got in the premiership. <laughs> it was amazing, after 41 years. And I wrote a kind of story about it. And Jan, the drummer from um, Monkey Island, was doing book publishing and poetry. And he published it. And we did an next, you know, I kind of uh, that was that was another brilliant thing. I was oh great, I can write, I try and write something, you know. I was always good at English. And I worked start around this time I started working for Core Arts and we just I've got, actually got like about there's about 50 of these flyers. We just did so many events and they're amazing, you know, it's just like um, you know, I was trying to tap Brit artists in like Marcus Harvey and people and Jimmy Courtney from the KLF and well, everyone I knew, put them alongside people with mental health issues, perhaps, or just just showing everyone the same, you know, so so people aren't fingered as kind of being one thing or the other, you know. And we, we did loads of exhibitions like this, wrote a book, um, 15 or so interviews with people about mental health and um, their responses to it um, for Hackney Museum and Core Arts and co-curated like the most successful music exhibition thankfully that um hackney, we, hackney um museum had in years which is about mental health in hackney and co-curated it with um, um my colleague tanya Han harris we started doing abney park festival meet me at the cemetery gates we just decided to start putting festivals on the local graveyard and in front of this kind of thing it was all abandoned and Hackney Council didn't own it or anything like that. It was just a, a trust and we raised money for the charities there. And doing a radio show, um, started off with Jan from Monkey Island as the drummer, um, as not your average type with Core Arts. And we took it on when, when I finished at Core Arts, we just carried on. It's called The Wild Dial and it's in hiatus at the moment and did it with my friend um, Colin Clay Chase, who's a musician who brought another angle to it, like LGBTQ plus hip hop and stuff and punk and, you know, amazing. And, Sometimes completely unknown people would send them our dem their, send us their demo tapes, like Sleaford and that was, was nuts, you know. I did another exhibition. My first solo show was about 45, something like that. So don't give up, kids. Um, Pigeons in Topiary. And um, this is like what the quote came from, this lovely quote that Billy wrote. But, you know, I don't know whether you did more than you deserve, definitely not, but, you know, I'm certainly doing my best. Um, I whizzed through these. It was in L13 Gallery, a basement space, which was kind of like going into a kind of, you know, like one of those old kind of Victorian museums or 1930s kind of museum. These are um, on, ca on raw canvas, oil stick and oil, just oil and paint, very thin paint. Really simple story. Um, 
my, me and my daughter found uh, an abandoned child that this mother was pulling the hair out. It's like a biblical scene. We found uh, what we saw two kids, and we found this, these two kids that she'd lost. And she fell on her knees, and could, we could watch it for a distance. We told the police and gave them to. The she fell on her knees and started wait, holding her arms in the air, you know, wailing, you know, with with relief, and then started shouting at them. And through nobody knew about this, just me and my daughter and the police and this woman. And and through this scene, this guy in rags dragged her. <laughs> Dragged a kind of cart, an empty cart across the kind of whole park. You know, nobody noticed him either. It was like a ghost. It was just, it's just like a biblical scene. It's just like, you know, wonderful. Uh, I did a book called um, The Poetry Machine, which was a kind of spoof cautionary tale about two Germans in between the war, a linguist and a mathematician who kind of love hate relationship. And um, it was kind of typeset by Steve Lowe from L13 Gallery, who really loves doing kind of graphic typesets and stuff and based on kind of photographs that I made, I kind of made the poetry machine out of a, I found a bird's nest with, um, with um, made out of wire that a bird had, when I was doing tree surgery, that had, he'd actually got the wire from an old factory, like a, like a swarf off a machine and made a metal nest out of it. But um, it got thrown away, so I had to remake it. You know, doing mono, um, these woodcuts doing paintings like that, going back to that kind of thing. I think uh, like that's a branch of something I never really kind of, that was, I think that was like a campfire doing a bit of colour. Peter Doig bought that one, which is good. Um, I think art's like a kind of, um, it's like a tree, you know, it's not linear. You go out and you, you maybe you reach the end of the, la the branch and it's these kind of paintings. Then you go back in and then you do something else and you come back like about a year later and it's, that idea's grown again, you can carry on with it, you know, maybe 20 years later, um, people are sending ladders. Uh, we, Steve from the gallery wanted to make something available to, for the people, so 10 inch vinyl, split vinyl between the new Monkey Island, or well, version two Monkey Island, and the double out, which was amazing. And that was the cover, it's all hand printed, hand stamped. Um, and that was one side, it was like a cross section of the band, it's called Defunctus Est. And the double O side was a screen print and it came with like, I got them to buy a Gestetner machine, a like a photocopier. Billy was like, I want to do a fanzine. I was like, I'm, I just look like your work. Um, let's get a Gestetner machine. And they were like, oh, brilliant. Yeah, you're nuts, let's do that. And just to, having someone to facilitate your ideas. It came with like, supposed to have a set of, an ink drawing, an ink print, but I didn't, I did, 20 drawings of Adam Smith, the economist with a, the Greek Olympic, a hat made of the Greek Olympic stadium, which was kind of abandoned. It was just before the Olympics, this, and like a turf, a kind of Dürer-esque kind of turf on his head as a kind of cautionary tale about legacy and stuff. This was pre kind of, this put 2011 or something. Like that. And that was a screen, the original screen for the cover. Um, I started doing, <laughs> I started doing stuff in my studio at, uh, up in Stoke Newington, this brilliant studio called Praxis, Praxis uh, Studios. And um, yeah, I've always liked Monty Python. I started doing these things called theme studios and unrelated artworks. But I was kind of, I'd written my thesis on the myth of American manhood. So I was kind of aware of the irony of me being this sort of macho tree surgeon, not actually being that macho. And this was the first theme studio with unrelated artworks, loads of kind of drawings and paintings, monoprints. And then I had music playing through the amplifier, through a microphone and stuff like that. It was just a way of making things more interesting. We ran a comedy club with a guy called Edward at last called Confuse. We ran that for six months and we were good, you know, because we, we gave the, the comedians money and beer and they never got paid usually. And it was quite good and it launched quite a lot of, things that went on, his career went on to do other stuff and that. He did it on, on top of Old Street Roundabout first when that was there. Believe it or not, you can do stuff, you used to be able to do stuff on the top of the round, actually on top of the roundabout. That grew into the Bethlehem Boys Club and we started, me and a guy called Alex Dorr, who now runs a gallery in Sheffield called Sydney and Matilda, started doing a spoof thing called the Bethlehem Boys Club, but it was kind of loads of artists again. And we did it in Stoke Newington. Um, that's me in my studio. Um, I'd moved to Hackney Wick and I was living in this building called Shapes. Um, that was a skateboard team, young skateboard team that came and stayed with me in my room one night because my mate, he films them and it was, that was hilarious. We all got drunk, we all sick over each other and stuff and then just carried on skateboarding. 
Um, this was another theme studio, another kind of slightly tongue in cheek called Fondly Remembering a Midlife Crisis. And it had loads of new work in it and still s similar themes. Uh, these, these are about, these are quite small, they're about two foot or something. Been on tour to Portugal, did lots of drawings of people just doing mundane kind of tasks. Uh, spent time in West Wales. Started doing landscapes, oil paints, you know, very small. That, this is like a, A4 kind of size. Tree surgeons, gas porters, man, you know, stand, standing next to water fountains, kind of quite really a painterly kind of thing. The next theme studio was Greetings from the University of, the obsolete, of obsolete Technology, the UO. And, um, you know, I made a load of cards like that. And um, it was basically obsolete technology. And I was doing like monoprints of bulldozers. I've seen a lot of bulldozers starting to creep into the world, you know, new builds and stuff. And Pinocchio spitting out, being spat out by the whale, you know. It's Freudian, isn't it? Deliberately, probably. Just kind of loads of drawings, um, pencil drawings. Always keep going back to drawing when I'm bored or kind of restless or need ideas. Very small, started drawing my mum's shoes and things. She had an amazing shoe collection, clogs and stuff. She was on the stage, so she had all this kind of stuff. Uh, Mono Prince, the city, um, Chariot Char 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 and Jews in, in, in um, Sanford Hill. Um, they looked like they were dancing, but they, he was kind of walking his daughter up the, up the hill with, she had cerebral palsy and she was, he was kind of walking with her and she, it looked like they were dancing, but she, was, she had this amazing look of like a 14 year old girl, like, I'm doing this on my own, granddad. Just stop, you know, stop embarrassing me. It was brilliant. Yeah. I did Speaker's Corner um, for the Speaker of Hackney Council and uh, an Arab Israeli um, peace hub kind of idea, which was interesting. Um, it's the only time I've ever done anything for the council. I, I, friend, some, somebody asked me to do it. It was, it was good. Got a lot of people in, a lot of people from Core Arts in there, which was really, really important. Uh, I produced an album in Hackney Wick, uh, an analogue studio in this Italian band called Stiff Cantarelli and the Silent Strangers, which is a brilliant blues album. And anyone who knows Hackney or Hackney Wick, that's the, the flyover. You know, they, they had this romantic idea that the River Lee was this kind of centre of the, the Lee Valley Delta or something like, like the Morning Bride album. <laughs> Did, uh, started doing festivals, free festivals in the park. Um, yeah, just putting people on, you know. Amazing mixture of bands and acts and rappers and stuff. Didn't always go to plan. <laughs> Hurricane one year, just got completely rained off. Crazy Spanish um, garage punk band. Absolutely brilliant. Can't remember the name, but go look at that. Um, this is when I started working at um, The Grow, really. So I was, I, there was a venue opened off across the road and it was amazing. I used to go there and we did We Shall Have a Come Festival trying to raise money. Um, for Australia, uh, people suffering from austerity and stuff like that. There's my offspring muddling the t-shirt. And that was a typical night at Grow um, and before we, we hit lockdown. Everything going on. Really good community, amazing place. Um, we did a, we turned my camper van into a kind of instant, instant camera, but it wasn't instant because it was all, it was a pinhole camera. And then we developed the film in the back with, I worked with a girl called Seven, Seven and a girl. And um, we did the art car boot fair and printed stuff like that. That's the band of Holy Joy. Like, we, you know, so that was done in the back of the van. Come back in 10 minutes, we'll be ready. And they, they got their um, pho photographs. It was really lovely. Uh, we set up in a world arts. We started working with kids. Uh, this was a project we did in Merton with kids who were kind of parenting, parenting their parents because the parents had mental health issues. Multi-engagement project, trying to make art really accessible for people. This was another project. We we got funded by the kind of church, so we kind of made this like a, a church youth fund or something. It wasn't supposed to be faith-based, but I kind of like running with the idea. It's like a rude screen or something where people could stick their own post-it notes and stuff. And the other side was like people's drawings who'd come to the art workshops and things like that, all kind of. You know, and they helped make that. And Popep came into my life, this Polish rapper who just turned up one night with his um, SpongeBob square pants, uh, underpants on, and said he wanted to make an album with me. And um, 
I thought he was crazy. I just knew who he was. I threw him out first, and then and then he he came back in, and sort of not. I said, "No, look, really, I want to make an album with you." So we went from like um, four hits on YouTube to like four hundred thousand or something, or you know, in about two days. And we we made a, an album with Popek, a blues album. This Polish rapper, who's a lovely guy, really interesting, really really good to work with. Really interesting working with different people. So that was the double O. So that's what the double O kind of looked like then, because um, I'd kind of moved on from everything like that. Um, doing drawing like this. I wish for a few small paintings, oil paint, landscapes. Kind of, I think that, these all got sold actually. This was Gandhi or something, you know, the pigeon on his head. I kind of like pigeons, they're survivors, aren't they? Like the runts and that. Can't, can't work out its blossom or flames. I started writing for, I was doing writing for Loud in the War magazine and hanging out with these, really privileged to hang out with these young kind of crime rappers who were using my equipment downstairs in the studios and Blue Daisy was brilliant and just absolutely intense performer, amazing person, super talented. He's pretty slow ties producer. And, you know, I kind of wrote about stuff, trying to champion stuff like this, you know. We went to America and there's your obligatory kind of ridiculous. Uh, this was with the membrane. So this is John, um, who was the guy who did the Blackpool Rocks fanzines back in the day. They needed a guitarist and it was a month tour. And can you drive a bit of the way like across the desert? Yeah, you get paid. Wow, brilliant, yeah. So we did that and we toured the whole of America in a month. Um, absolutely incredible, you know. Not really come back probably your typical, you know, Wim Wenders kind of road music thing. I did like six, about 60 drawings on the way, just working through the landscapes, got stranded in the desert, had to, broke down, but got to watch a desert sunset. You know, everything's a gift in it. It's kind of stuff like this with the kids' pencils again. Got to meet Joe Biafra. He actually played on stage with us, so I was his guitarist. I mean, there's, a, there's always a 14-year-old inside here that never kind of, grows up or gives up and that's it so that's a full circle in it the guy who taught me about politics you know penny rambo and um killer biafra you get to play with him and he was really nice we had beers together he's not straight edge and my mum was really pleased when i got back and gave her a load of dollar and she loves playing up stuff like that i did some drawings and paintings when i came back from america my mum was getting old and she died. And you know, I took my daughter to Israel for a holiday to kind of get over all that. And it's really nice. It kind of changed my work a bit, but I kind of, you know, you always rely on stuff. I don't, I'm not religious, but you keep going back to things like that. It's kind of, it's a comfort in it. It's kind of, it's kind of placebo comfort, isn't it? If you're not religious. But I just like the, I like the way those old Romanesque paintings are, are made and they're just so brilliant, the carvings. It's like the animals are more, there's more detail in the animals than the people. I started drawing um, East London, painting East London, very small paintings like A4 size, oil paint, Hackney Wick or East London. Uh, I started climbing, you know, I, I had a lot of stuff to sort out. It was family stuff. Tree surgery wasn't happening. I need to keep fit. Yeah, someone got me into climbing. Probably the girl in that picture, actually. And I started drawing climbers. And I decided I was going to become a climbing instructor within a year because I thought it was really good for mental health, everyone I talked to. And I did. I did it in eight months anyway. So that's me being a bit flash. But I'm really pleased that we ran this project. It's, it's amazing. A Hackney Wick Boulder project. The nightclub shapes had turned into a boulder wall. And with, with their help and other people, we kind of set this project up through Inner World Arts and... It's an ongoing thing. It, climbing's really good for you. Uh, it keeps you really fit as well. It's just really good for every, it ticks every box. I did, I got commissioned by the gallery to do this for James Courtney, the guy from the KLF, who'd done a kind of, he was doing a tour of riot, torn cities, cities that had riot, had had riots in them. This was the Hackney riot one. And it was a kind of mono, monologue, really quite rude, you know, about the councillors and, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And, I wanted to say, I hope this inspires a riot, but they made they, they tapped in of radical rethinking. So I said, okay, well, if I cross that out and sign a few, can you sell them at double the price? And he was like, yeah, that's a good idea. 
And then the last, um, this was 2016. Remember, everyone thought that was the worst year ever because like David Bowie and Prince died. It's like, <laughs> wait to see 2020. Anyway, this was the Amnesian Almanac. The Amnesian, Amnesian Almanac. And um, it was just, it was kind of, yeah, it was about forgetting. It was kind of weird piece of work. Like it was a, it was a theme studio and stuff. I made my own climbing holes and, and some of them were like rock and they were strewn on the floor. And I was kind of doing, you know, like, anyway, we, we turned it into this in Hackney Wick with my friend Alex Fox as a kind of joint exhibition, uh, as a kind of spoof of like for and against nature. It was kind of the time of the Extinction Rebellion was starting up and the Hoisman's book, Against Nature, we, we kind of like, well, can we be in between that like, for and against, you know? So it's kind of Joe, Alex designed the post, it's great. And this was the kind of thing, we did it in Schwartz, um, we just kind of left the gallery as it was. We painted bits of it out with black. And, and this was my bit. And it was this kind of the Indian rope trick, really. My mum's disappearing act, if you like. She was such a performer. And it kind of led somewhere, you know. It kind of led nowhere. Then it kind of led into this room with these, all the kind of coloured homemade climbing holes that are made like that. And, um, you know, climbing's cool. That was interesting. And that was, oh yeah, got to show it because it's got Alex's work in it. He carved like Viking, Viking head cyclists and stuff like that. It's absolutely brilliant and massive abstract paintings. And um, yeah, so then I got to be a rock star, which was really cool. And I went on tour with the Membranes in Germany and every night was like that. Instead of playing kind of little punk venues and that, we're on tour with the Sisters of Mercy and, we thought we'd have like 50 people watching us as a support band, but not in Europe. It was rammed out for when we went on stage and I just absolutely loved it every minute of it. And we're just smashing it and just wonderful people and you know, great photographers making us look really cool. And I started drawing statues. So I was kind of weirdly got back to that statue thing, you know, like, and um, this, Europe's so full of statues and stuff. And I started doing these mashups, you know, like statue mashups. I was drawing all these on tour, I did like, again, like 80 drawings on tour, kind of weird stuff, defile, you know, just kind of, you know, everyone's tried to swallow a chair leg one point, and you? you know, just take the icons down. That was um, Gone Postal, that was another exhibition I did in the open studios, all on postal bags. And I did little sculptures as well of these things. And I started doing these kind of things based on rough drawings, based on kind of East, East European or kind of what was kind of springing up the architecture around, you know, it's kind of had similarities. It's kind of blocky, you know. I imagine if graffiti artists actually painted old masters on the side of the buildings, or maybe they were the kind of impression of the people that they'd left or, you know, who lived there. I went on tour to Italy. Someone took, like, took, took me around a really weird cafe. And we were based in Mussolini's old town of Forli. And um, it's, got the, it's got like the world's biggest post office. It's really into post office. It's like a palace, this post office. And so I did start doing, I did Mussolini as an egghead. Why not? And, you know, stuff like in Ferenz, you know, where the, where the, where the Medici lions come from, of course. And cranes started coming into work because we were under threat all the time in Hackney Way. Everything was getting demolished. There's just a sea of cranes. At one point, there was not, not enough cranes in, Europe, in, in Britain to kind of go around. You know, they're all in Hackney Way. My daughter did a drawing of a crane, like a catapult. So I just ran with that and made it into that. And just did loads of these drawings. Just A4 ink. That was Cranezilla. That was the thing that were, you, the met, you know, the kind of bulldozer bit is the kind of thing that actually chumps up buildings when you want them demolishing, mixed with Godzilla. And then I had an exhibition with um, Danny. This is like, oh, this is um, on canvas, um, just blank canvas, oil paint, spray paint. And then um, met a young lad, 21 years old, called Dan Danny Spivakov from the Ukraine really full of ideas and excitement. It reminded me of people like in the 80s, who was into Julian Schnabels and stuff like that, into 80s art, and started doing these kind of paintings for this exhibition called Fallen Statue in the Tree, and there we are. 
I was really pleased. It was like his first exhibition. He told me afterwards he'd never had an exhibition before. I thought he was, he was just super cool. We, we just kind of did this, yeah, let's do it. We did it in this place around the corner in Hattonwick called Blase. And, you know, these places, these warehouses and stuff, they're like, that's, you know, people want to live in New York in the 1970s. It's kind of like that sometimes where we are, you know, you're living through, you don't know the times you're living through. You know, it's super, super cool. Like, it's better to do exhibitions in warehouses. Then we did the lab. Um, Gro asked me and my f um, colleague J Joel Smith to do a, an artist res residency in this Grow Eco pod. And we all we wore lab coats and things like that. And we got t shirts made. That's Trevor, the actual driver of that thing. And he was like super cool. He was like, I'm from Dagenham. I really don't want to destroy all these artist studios. It's just my job, mate. He's like, all right. And I was like, yeah, no worries. Do you want a t shirt? He's like, packer, mate. I said, can I have a go on your, on your machine? He said, if you see me out in the countryside, yeah, why not? But they're not around here. There's too many people there. Like, really nice guy. And we started doing sort of Dada esque kind of stuff like that. And just this is what's happening, you know. And loads of gas. Yeah, everyone's just leaving these balloon canisters around. So we started personalizing them, you know, and kind of trying to sell them to people as a spoof, you know. And philosophers in drug bags because. Everyone's a philosopher when they're on drugs, aren't they? Really, you really know that, don't you? When you talk to them, this was like a typical day in the lab. You know, we had a mobile kind of lab on a bike that we used to drive around, and we had the kind of VW camper, the, the old military camper, Wunderschwer camper thing, um, with products in it. And we did things like playing um, the Red Army Choir at full volume through the PA and into the yard and recite getting academics to recite um jack london's people of the abyss you know so people told us to stop um yeah well, that's self-explanatory if, you, if you're from around me uh, i started making slime i thought slime was like a kind of a metaphor for all the things that kind of invade our lives you know stress financial well this was kind of gender shaming slime you know uh, kids were making it and i've got my daughter and my, my child to teach me it, how to do it uh, gentrification slime. We're selling them as spoof products. Joel was writing tons of poetry on till rolls, on loo rolls, on brown rolls, on blue rolls. And we took it out and this was the lab. It was part, it was like serious fun, that like part humour. I started making art out of typewriter. So I'd use, I'd make the pictures just typing pound signs and kind of, um, Cyclic poetry. Some naughty people didn't like what was going on in the area and these new builds and they wrote things on them. We did fanzines, Joel's poems, my drawings. Ian Sinclair, we did a radio, we did a, 10 podcasts all about the lo local area interviewing people, commissioning artists to do things and uh, Ian Sinclair kind of said that with his, you know, really lovely, great writer. Um, I sent my love for butter and milk. I sent her for sweet wine. She returned to me empty handed and gave me this reply. The cow she labours fruitlessly. The grape drinks from the vine. It's a crime to ask for butter milk in these troubled times.
So that was the lab um, made um, by, it was a film called The Wick, um, and they did a film on the lab as well as part of that. And these were the kind of, the drug oh, these are the kind of products we kind of offer for sale. Um, there's a lot of building work going on, like the demolition of the cathedral. So you could wear one of those if you want, and I'll show you the um, cathedral inside. This was what the double looked like at home, right? And all the Pedula and weights, which is amazing. Um, I was just drawing, I went, I was in Berlin, my partner um, lived in Berlin and this is another kind of thing I was doing, I didn't know, it was kids pencils again. Um, sorry to interrupt, you've just gone a bit quiet. Has it? Can everyone hear? Am I still there? Yeah, that's much better. Is it? Okay. Yeah, sorry, I'm in Berlin now and um, I'm drawing again, like Hackney Wick and uh, Always go back to drawing, what's going on around. Draw a lot of reflections. The drawing's getting subtler and kind of more ghostly like. That's uh, some, some, some vandals kind of drawn on, utilize those strange things that no one's ever used and turn them into cranes. And I started doing ink drawings of buildings. It's got a bit slower, sorry. And cranes and Engels, you know, I was in Manchester as well. Engels, he lived in he lived in Manchester, and his favorite his favorite saying was "Take it easy." So imagine him whistling "Take it easy." Great Engels. Yeah, I did some coffee bags to raise awareness and cash, I think, for core arts. You know. And we did grow, grow change self-organizing we, um, which, you know, I think is really worth mentioning, which was amazing. And this was part of the film, The Wick, and this was what grow was like. Um, they are literally cleansing people. Yeah, there you go. Um, I started doing cartoon books and one, the Bible's really long, isn't it? I got about a quarter of the way through Isaiah. I found a study Bible. I just use anything I can get my hands on, really. I just like these three drawings. I think they've got something. It might be another branch of the tree, mightn't it? Someone gave me an old sound system. It was getting thrown away. It belonged to a play group in Hackney and it was an original sound system from Tottenham and Hackney that were being used back in the day and they'd been using it as a PA and it was all beat up and I couldn't let it die and I called my friend Jess up, my workmate as well, and, and just said, you love reggae, you love the dub, can we, you know, and we, I ended up sleeping in the van with it. We kind of moved on the speakers, a couple of speakers and I was sleeping in the van and we finally found a home with it and for it and we you know, this team of volunteers of which I've been kind of very kind of inactive lately um, in, in kind of actually sanding cabs down and painting it. Uh, uh, Ted Wood, people, proper Hackney people, Jess, or Shireen Lee and that, um, been restoring it into, and it's a community sound system and sound systems are beautiful. They bring people together, you know, and they become really fashionable now and stuff. And we're just looking forward to getting it back out putting a big community meal on and watching everyone smile on the basics. And I did another show for the L13 
never never uh, miss an opportunity to, to utilize your offspring in a kind of punk pose i just thought she looked really cool um, and um, that was our punk exhibition i was drawing stuff like this of course cranes i designed a tattoo for a guy at the climbing center because he was really tall and he wanted a giraffe and he, he liked my drawing so he's got it tattooed in his arm that, that that's probably like the best compliment ever isn't it i mean i don't care how much money you pay for it you got it on. so i went to france uh, and um did a couple of gigs with a guy way from way back in in the in the old Stoke some blues punk days from France from Bordeaux called Petit Vaudot and this was the ridiculous poster we, did, we designed and I did a couple of gigs out there in Bordeaux with him you know um, and had the best roadie in the world even though they had broken their arm skateboarding and when I got back the best roadie in the world aka my child had the same sentiment as me and sent me that that they really crudely photoshopped of something that was happening in the area and um, I thought fair enough you know even you're feeling it um okay what is this this is the wick film um made a film about Hackney Wick uh Carlos the uh, filmmaker and um the suddenly left us um Catherine Miles Griffiths and myself were really involved in this that's the title shot and there's lots of stuff in it, but here's me spouting off. As the you legacy know. is not there. It's not being put in place. And this is what we're angry about. And to be honest, I think Hackney Wick is the point where there's nowhere else to go. It's a sharp edge. Where there's a canal there. There's an Olympic Park and all the new developments staring us in the face of what this is going to turn into. And we're on the edge of it. And because we've got nowhere to go, because we're in a corner, we're fighting. <laughs> got lots of amazing interviews with artists and, and musicians and stuff and loads of me just trying to tell it like tell it like it is I think fascism is on the rise that's uh, I did these kind of ghostly ones of like Oswald Mosley and it's climbing out of the drain you know and, you know um, is it a civet civet made of letters yeah more stuff in Berlin and then more of these kind of statue mashups. And then they started to combine in a, one night in, in a bar in Berlin when I had no paper, I started drawing on things and turned them into these things called the Doomsday Manuals, which are kind of lighthearted. I like Calypso music used to have this kind of theme, you know, it, was, it, had, it, it had a kind of beat and then it had, it'd have a kind of um, a, a refrain that was always there, like working for the Yankee dollar. And then it had like contemporary events kind of interspersed into it with a bit of kind of filthy humor or something like that. And I, I kind of like something like that. I wish I had more Calypso records. I do, I can't collect records anymore. I live on a boat and a van. And these were the doomsday manuals. And then we did um, this for the VNA, which was working with an architect. In Berlin, um, there's big bunkers that you can't, they can't demolish. They would they blow up half the area if they, and they're too big, too reinforced. They're from the war, so they build tower blocks over the top of them. I thought you could do that. You could, and a strategy for architecture would be to treat things as it's a bunker mentality. It, it is a, it's just an old shed with loads of artists in, but treat it like it's an immovable object and work around it. And then you keep a ground level and you build above them. So I did loads of collages like this of, of the area, and I worked with an architect. Um, um, came up with this, you know, I, I, just, I, I said, I want a brutalist building like that, you know, to go over kind of, Grow would be there. Unfortunately, Barnighty would be there. They'd, they'd be a bit shaded from the sun, but never mind, never mind. And this is the back of the van, um, which we uh, did for the VNA lates, which was just mobbed with people. It was like absolutely brilliant to kind of, you know, you do stuff for years and years and then just people actually see it. It's not bad. It is like, you know, it's, it's not, sometimes you shouldn't be afraid of it. You know, I, when I worked out on stage and there was 2,000 people in Hamburg, I just thought, actually, you know, this isn't too bad. You know, I'm, 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 I'm going to do it honestly. They're going to get the, they're going to get the full treatment, you know. So, um, yeah, another thing was in Germany, the Schwerbelastungskorpen, which was this huge, big concrete block that looks like a massive circular concrete block. 
it's enormous. It's like tower block size. They can't move it. You could just turn it. And uh, these these things started turning into kind of a lot a, a longer. It's just going to grow around the walls, isn't it? That they're just uh, oil paint on the back of canvas, and then spray paint on the front of canvas, and then you turn them round, and you get this kind of bleeding effect. I really love that's kind of really ghostly, and you know, people leave impressions, don't they, on buildings? They say, and this was the this was the kind of um, this was the last um, pre-lockdown themed studio and unrelated artworks. I designed that for us, uh, a poem by Osip Mendelssohn about Voronezh, which is a Russian city. Sorry, I pronounce it very badly, but uh, Osip Mendelssohn was carted away by these black cars that he called Little Ravens and, and died in, in a gulag, you know, on, on the way to a gulag, of, of, you know, something awful like starvation and, and froze to, just literally froze to death, you know. And, he created his eyes, Stalin's moustache, you know. But he would have had a bad time of it anyway, because the Germans were like, the, the Nazis rather, were like very close. So if it had been caught by them, they'd have probably done him in as well. So um, um, George Surtees was doing, had done a load of variations on, on his poems and a friend asked me to illustrate. And I imagined it as a kind of prison tattoo on top of the city. And I wanted to make the city... If it gets used, if we do it, it's, things like this take ages. I'll, I'll, write, I'll, I'll make the city out of Cyrillic type from the typewriter. And this was the last thing we did before lockdown, the Bethlehem Boys Club up in Sheffield, which is kind of going strong up there. And this was a kind of um, a feasibility study, a dossier, you know, with all these drawings, you know, these, these black and white ink drawings, you know, name, study, area, Hackney Wit, you know, blah, blah, blah. Shimmering illusion, future ghost town, ink, tower block I, I did a quick a quick fanzine for my partner who's written a book called shame uh, or a gender and negative effects oh, i can't remember the title what's the title writing shame. writing shame it's a fantastic book um this is what the double o look like now this is what hackney wit looks like right now and this is pretty much how i feel about everything still and so, can I see you? Is anyone still there? Yep. Cool. Um, what I'll do is just like, I'm just going to slide through, show through the latest work, which I did just before lockdown, like really fast. Um, and um, if people want to ask me questions or anything, that'd be really cool. But um, yeah, We've got a few questions and comments, Pete. When cool. This, this bit. And just reel through these climbers. Started using watercolor. More, more apocalypse manuals. We all knew who that is, don't we? <laughs> Who's in the bunker? Can't get out. Little men. So these are all like watercolors. Um, oh yeah, the three the three voices of popularism, the Edwardians, the 1930s, and the modern, you know, Twitter or whatever crazy platform the far right are using now. I do, I'm starting to do the watercolours of the home, homeless or the street people. And I quite like, almost influenced by stuff my granddad kind of had in his house, like really kind of weird arabesque kind of watercolours that people collected in the 1930s. I quite like them. Something, there's a quality to them. We can go back to anything you want, if there's anyone left in the talk. It's a bit of a marathon, isn't it? But, you know, in terms of Proust, it's only, it's only like three pages of remembrance. Yeah. And this is what I write. I write, I actually write the music in a program 
and it plays samples from the London Phil. So it reads it like that. And I think it's amazing. I taught myself to read music again, which was, but I think music should be like that. It should read from the center and go outwards, like cyclic music. And these are the late, this was the last collage I did. It's called Colosseum. And this is the music goes with it. And this is the last thing you're gonna, you can ask me questions now. Thank you, Pete. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, that was incredible. Um, I'm going to just um, read out some comments that have come through um, on Facebook so far. Um, Gina, Faust Gina Southgate said um, the painting is great. And that was the one where you were um, included references to Hillsborough. Simon Cole on Facebook said Proustian time compression. Just dropping that one in there. Um, Julia Bell sends some emojis of clapping and a star. Um, Afua Thomas on Facebook says, do you, this is a question, do you plan a, a phase of work or does it happen in response to what's going on in life around and, and when and how do your ideas form? Right. Um, I'll just reply to Simon. I actually, got, I actually did a Twitter, a fake Twitter account called Ian Proust, who was like a taxi driver who, who kind of... Um, used to compress time, but I haven't, I haven't really done much with it yet. Um, do, I, do I work with the... Uh, what kind of phase of work does it happen in response to what's going on around you? When and how do ideas form? I don't know. I mean, I, I know this, that, you know, like if I do something like when I'm on my foundation course, it's like something, I, I think you just paint the same picture over and over again. And I think lots of artists have said that, and it's probably a little bit of a cliche, but... I was drawing statues, like, you know, that was, that was my kind of big moment. I'm going to do this one big painting. And I was expecting them to say, oh, that's really good. You know, you've, you've, you've kind of used all the things you've learned and made this statement. And they didn't, didn't really like it. You know, it wasn't kind of, and that's fine, you know. But, and I thought, no, you know, why the hell did, yeah, it's really boring. I just drew a lion. I was trying to make some point about imperialism. I'm 19 years old. What do I know about the world? And then, like, years later, you're doing kind of statue mashups. And you are trying to make a point about the world, about narrative, about history, about how things are constructed. Like this talk is completely constructed. You know, I mean, this isn't the narrative is, you know, if, if I, you know, if you, if you actually could pull it apart, it's probably just bits here, bits there, bits, bits that are kind of semi remembered, mostly kind of. Yeah. And I don't really know whether you have a kind of a theme. It just it just comes. I don't know. I mean, it kind of comes to me. I don't know how to make a picture and I don't know how to write a song. And, and, you know, like when, when, when the band have done like, like Monkey Island, we used to have a terrible trouble. Like, you know, I'd, we'd, I'd write the song, I'd write the music and that. And Jan, the drummer, was, was an amazing lyricist. We both wrote lyrics. I, mine were very kind of, mine was about disrupting the narrative. You know, it really was about like cut up kind of things and disrupting it and re remaking a kind of narrative, but very phonetically and very, you know, something that wove between it. And, and his was more about writing kind of unusual narratives. And I, I don't know how to write a song. We, we, we do it and then I, it go, we go, great, we need to write something else like that. And it's just like, mm, that's boring, isn't it? You know, or, or we just couldn't do it. It just sounded a bit, you know, just through, you know, you throw so many things away, like really good paintings that you could keep or whatever, because I'm not very good at kind of repeating or having themes. 
But I know one thing, it's like you get onto something and you don't know why you're doing it. Like the last few paintings there, the drawings that are just sort of sepia. I've no idea where I'm doing them. They almost feel like a sort of release, you know, like I'm doing it almost unconsciously. They might not be very good. They might actually lead to something really interesting that, that just goes off in a different direction. Like when we were doing the lab with Joel, it was just like, we just like went like that, you know. I thought, why why is Jordana put Joel with me? Why is Joel, you know, Joel probably thought, mm, Pete, really? You know, and he's like a generation apart. And suddenly it's just like, bang, you know. It, you know, you kind of egg yourself on, you kind of, and then it just runs out. And, it, and it, it, it's like a tree. It really literally is like, I'm a tree surgeon. That's, you know, I climbed a lot of trees. You go out on a limb and you prune it or you, you get to the end, you can't go any further. You go back into the stem, you go, you go out on another limb. You might be like 20 years down the line, you go right down the tree and go revisit something. And that theme, it's like it's grown as an idea without you being there and you can still pursue it. So it, I just kind of follow things. Yeah, what, yeah once I get on something, I, 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 I'm obsessive, you know. Yep. Most pieces of music, there's 15 of them, and whether they're good or bad or whatever. I, I spend like, I spent 15 to 16 hours to get one, pe one minute of music. Absolutely driven, uh, came my partner, completely nuts. I didn't think my OCD was of that level, but you know, it's, it's shocking, you know. Yep. It's just, you just obsession and and then it, and then it wears out and you get you burn out you know there's a lot of burnout in art there's a lot of the whole business is, if it, the whole business is about self doubt it really is it's about challenging yourself and self doubt and if you're super confident you're kind of probably famous and, and an illustrator or something like that it's, mm. if you I'm not trying to say it's really romantic it's not romantic it's a pain in the ass you know and I think a lot of people who do comedy or art or that they they have these kind of, you know, moments of, or phases of kind of on a the theme, and then you're just like, this is crap, I'm not doing that anymore. It's just, sorry, yeah. the long answer. I mean, I think that's an amazing answer. I think the tree analogy um, will give um, Afua some answers about how um, how you, you experiment without plans, but it kind of, it works itself out. Um, got another question um, from Stuart Thomas. Um, you might know them because you've always been an inspiration to them. He said, great talk. Um, any plans for the E9 drawings on a bigger scale or them into a different medium? Bloody love them in any right. They're really accessible. The E9 drawings? Yeah, I think I got that correct. I got messaged to that question. Um, David, yeah, I mean, is, is, do you know which one I'm, I'm talking about, Pete? That's Which were the E9 one? Like, yeah. like E9's Hackney Wick, isn't it? It pro probably, yeah, yeah. I mean, they've been shown in, you know, like they, they've, they've been shown in in warehouses and stuff. I don't. I mean, there's literally hundreds of drawings. I, I do too, you know. I do too much work. I mean, I don't. But if there were, if there were oil paintings and they cost me a fortune, and, and I've got get this, you know, my art dealer Steve or whatever. He's not. He'll hate me calling me an art dealer. So I'm going to call him an art dealer because he hates the art world. He's like the worst art dealer in the world. He facilitates all the artists, but hates kind of engaging with it. But he he's got garages full of paintings. You know, it's like you have to be able to sell them, and they're like, Pete, make another six foot painting. You know, and I can. And you just can't. You know, you've got to get rid of them. And you know, like how people people can't even afford a flat or to, to rent a flat, so they're not going to take up the whole wall with like a. A painting that's cost them like two months rent or something so yeah i have I'd, I'd love to do more exhibitions i'm actually doing an exhibition at harness and main which is a hairdresser's a hair salon in in wolfenstow which was actually all framed up ready to be done yeah. before the um lockdown and it was just like should we i think we better cancel this it looks like something's happening here you know, everyone, everyone's got that story, haven't they? Whether you're a venue owner or a, you're going to work and it's just like, oh dear, I don't know what's going to happen. But that's that's ready to go. And they're all the kind of slightly kind of, ero I don't know, not erotic, but kind of pervy, kind of like fetishy, kind of statue -y kind of things like that. Com coupled with the kind of nocturne stroke diurn type building ones. So yeah, that, there is that ready to go. Yeah, at Harness and Main. Next. Yeah, we'll look forward to that. I do remember it ever so nearly got open, didn't it? But yeah, it did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess it can open next week. Or we so. might even play at it. Maybe we'll even be able to touch each other and kind of. Go, oh. Maybe not too far away. Um, 
So I'm going to read out uh, John Pook's uh, comment, and I hope I pronounce the words correctly. So John, chip in if I don't. Hi, Pete. Thanks so much for the talk and images. Really brilliant, inspiring, witty, sardonic. Love how the work is so political in Hogarthian Crookshank tradition, com commentating with black humour and poignancy. Um, he's also got a question for you, which is a very good question, another Brilliant. poignant question from himself. You've been so prolific with your with the exhibitions, installations, zines and musics. What's brewing post-apocalypse? What's brewing? Um, I don't know. Does anyone like, well, yeah, that exhibition is hopefully going ahead. You know, I mean, my hairdresser, I definitely need a hairdresser. I'm booked in for a haircut. So she's going to do that. I, you know, I, I was looking at some skateboarders the other day and, and and they were like 16 years old and they were sort of staring at me and I, and I thought, I know what you're thinking. You're you're thinking that poor kid, he's only 16, he's got one of those illnesses that makes you look really old. It's, it's just like, look at the state of this. Mm -hmm. So that's probably going to happen. Um, and then, I don't know. What I want to I want to do, I actually want to do the big, um, I see the, the, the watercolours of the, of the people, the street people, big you know and 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 like oil paint and you know really just get stuck into some oil paint and i see that theme of the the kind of really bleak kind of very understated buildings just growing around a kind of wall you know and, and being you know i just want to work I'd, I'd love to work big 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 yeah. big but you know like like billy billy who wrote the beautiful thing about us i mean he's got a gallery you know he's got a dealer he he can kind of do what i do but on a on the scale of that bookcase behind me and yeah. someone will take them away. And it's just like, yeah, you know, he's worked hard to get into that position. I, you know, I, I, I have them. <laughs> we want to see those big ones. So we'll, um, you know, something, hopefully something will mean that you can go big again. Um, just a, a shout out to anybody else on, uh, on this zoom, I'm going to wrap up shortly. So if you've got any um, comments, you just want me to squeeze in to give Pete before uh, we go, please do. Um, or questions indeed. Uh, Juliana, um, who you know well, um, yeah. has comments saying, thanks for the great talk, have to go now, but it's been lovely to catch up with your work. Love the collages of the buildings with the music superb um, work. Ciao. Um, Jacob, yeah. uh, Jacob Nicholson says, uh, nice work, nice one, Pete, amazing stuff. See you at the wall next week. So I'm guessing he's a fellow- See um, on the wall. I need to lose a bit of weight and get my fingers strong. Yeah, yeah, as we probably all do. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah and I'll be open soon. I saw the climate talk. Uh, uh, good for everybody. Good for well-being, isn't it? Um, bouldering. So get back at the bouldering project. Um, I mean, I, I'm just gonna uh, just let you know, let you know that never before have I found it so challenging to like form a question or a closing comment about an artist, Pete. Um, Every time I started writing it out, and I mean, I've got reams of paper here, you offer some new fusion, you diverge, you shift gear, you switch material, your genre, et cetera, et cetera. And I sort of came to the couple of conclusions that I understand why Billy Child has described your work as a celebration of the very nature of poetic being, because poetry seems the only way to do it and very apt. I mean, a word that did come to me, um, which is uh, something I'm quite interested in at the moment is ectoplasm, um, which I didn't expect it to, but you seem to sort of manifest yourself via whatever medium your, whether it's performance or whatever, whatever medium you seem to have at the, um, in your hands. Um, so I'll just return to the word prolific and uh, uh, John also um, picked that word as well. And I looked up the definition of it whilst we were, while we we're online and, it, and the definition is producing much fruit or foliage or many offspring. So, you know, from Blackpool to Hackney Wick to everything in between, you've planted seeds for fruit and, and you know, from all of us, um, may long you continue. Um, so thank you so much for, you know, this absolute journey. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure lots of people will be very interested to see this. And, you know, I reckon you could come back and do one every week with them out you've, you've experienced and got to say. So I just like to say thank you on behalf of Grove for being involved in hosting these talks and now, um, now uh, showing your work and um, we'll bring these talks back so we'll be announcing more artists involvement soon so uh, yeah. and hopefully you'll be back hosting um so on behalf of everybody watching and everyone here um thank you so much pete thank you um thank you for all of you anyone watching 
and participating. Thank you so much. You know, it's kind of it's the reason any artist does it. Does it? Every, they all say I could work in a vacuum and just I'd get on with it. But we actually like people to watch us, and we all do, don't we? We all want a bit yeah. of praise. And it's a language, and it's a, you know, it's a mutual thing. It's a back and forth, and um, we've all enjoyed receiving it and, and giving it back to you today. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you very much. Bye. See you on the other side.